If you think about the beginning of the movie 2001, where if you'll remember, the ape comes up to the, to the, the stone monolith, and, and then when the ape goes back and picks up a bone, it undergoes a transition. At first, it's simply an ape holding a bone. But then the realization dawns that the bone is a weapon that the bone becomes something very different. In a way, it's very, it's very much like some of the things that Heidegger says, right? It's, it's the bone becoming part of the ape because an ape with a bone is just an ape with a bone, but an ape with a bone that knows that bone is a weapon, that's a different kind of organism. And so humans, more than any other species, have this ability to couple to their technologies a person who is coupled into a social network is more than just their brain, their cognition, their Cartesian self. They're part of a, a network from which cognition evolves in ways that's unpredictable. That's extraordinary, but it's also very, very human. So in some ways, uh, technology is the physical side of the human project. And while it's, it's got cultural dimensions, social dimensions, economic dimensions, uh, it's very important to realize that humans are not apart from technology, that we integrate with technology, that technology becomes a part of us. Look at the students walking around a college campus. They're integrated with their technologies. It's part of them. It becomes an extension of their personality and their personality exists in part because of the technologies that they have coupled to. So I think that, that to look at technology is really to look at the human with all its flaws and its failures. And again, because technology is a powerful earth system, it's how we impact other systems. Uh, it becomes an ethical responsibility to understand it and respond to it and manage it. The, the reality is that technology operates at a number of different levels and you have to evaluate it differently depending on that level and you have to understand what the implications are of technology at that level. So if you begin by looking at, at technology very simply, then the reason that human beings adopt technologies is because they work. If I get in a car, a car takes me from point A to point B, and it does so effectively and very safely. That, that level of technology is why people adopt technologies. When, when you first developed railroads, they were very efficient ways of uh, increasing commerce and being able to move people and things faster, more effectively, and in many cases, more safely. So that was a primary effect of the railroads. They were just good at that. But they also did a lot of things that people didn't expect. So for example, if you ran a small general store in a town in the middle of America, in 1820 or 1830, when the railroad first came through your town, you would not have realized that on the backs of those tracks, there were forces coming in that would completely destroy your local economy. Big sugar, big oil, trusts, monopolies, uh, national economies of scale. All of these came in on railroads and they profoundly changed the economic behavior of the country. But nobody predicted it. And they didn't because it's very difficult to predict these secondary effects of technologies. Now, in our world especially, you also have uh, uh, Earth systems effects of powerful technologies. If what I want is something to take me from point A to point B, a car is a very efficient technology. It operates very well at that level and I understand the implications. But cars operate in networks, which means I need transportation systems, I need petroleum, I need, uh, I need to build uh, roads, bridges, they need to be interconnected, I need to, to be able to have rights of way to do that. And what you end up with is in a very complicated social and uh, technical and physical infrastructure that is a result of the car technology. Predictable, and we're used to it, but again, it's a systemic implication that we don't think about uh, when we first look at the car as an artifact. But then there's a third level too, which is the way that cars are affecting uh, our expectations around the world in terms of what we think of as the good life, uh, the way that cars uh, are impacting the environment, which we're very familiar with, but also the way cars impact our idea of personal freedom, which tends not to be uh, picked up if you're looking, for example, at only the environmental impacts of cars. So 
I know env I have environmentalist friends who look at cars and talk about how terrible cars are. But what they don't understand is what those cars mean to people. When I was in the Army uh, during, during Vietnam, uh, there were a lot of kids that were going through basic training with me that had pinups. And half of these pinups were what you would expect out of young males doing basic training in the Army. But the other half were of cars. They had, they had pictures of their, their muscle cars, their Chevys, their Fords. That's what they had up. That's what they looked at before they went over to Vietnam and got killed. That's extraordinary. Unless you understand that dimension of cars, you really don't understand that technology at all. Um, uh, why is it that in, in some countries, women are not allowed to drive? Is it because people are afraid they don't understand stop signs? No, it's a very profound statement about human freedom. Unless you understand these dimensions of technologies, you're very liable to misunderstand the impacts of those technologies and the reason that they're so difficult to control. So if you want to ban cars in this country, it's not going to happen. And it's not because people are thinking only about the environmental effects, it's because what you're talking about is a technology that a lot of people perceive as a source of personal freedom, and you're proposing to take it away, that's just not gonna work. The idea of the Anthropocene is that we now live in an era where systems are dominated by human impacts. It doesn't mean that we plan it. It doesn't mean that we've tried to build a world that looks like this, but it means that right now, that's where we are as a result of our activities. We're a very successful species in terms of our ability to, to uh, uh, procreate and to dominate Earth systems and manage them to our benefit. Anywhere you look, whether it's the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle, the hydrologic cycle, the dynamics of the atmosphere, uh, economics, culture, what you see is a world that is increasingly dominated by human decisions, human activities, human technologies, and all of these need to be considered as global systems. So to think of this Earth as something that we're simply going to draw back from so we don't impact it, I think is a dangerous naivete. We have to, if we're going to be ethical, understand that we are now operating at a scale where that's no longer possible, if it ever was. And that what we have to do is learn how to manage the Earth in ways that are ethical and responsible. Now, that doesn't mean you have to give up, for example, natural areas like the Everglades uh, or, or the national parks in, in Africa or Asia. What it does mean is that where they exist, they exist because we've planned for them, we legally protect them, and they're part of the design that we have created for that area so that we have responsibility for it. If our environmental issues arise from the fact that we now have seven billion people on this planet, each one of which wants a better life, uh, each one of which wants their children to live better, then environmental issues are not trivial. And they're not just environmental. This is where the idea of sustainability comes in because if you only try to optimize the environmental, then politically it's going to fail because most people value the environment, but it may not be their primary value. To an environmental activist, for example, uh, global climate change is the most important issue, and it's worth sacrificing many things to try to manage global climate change. But to an average person, they're also interested in jobs, they're interested in a comfortable life, they're interested in a number of other things in addition to the environment, and that's the person that we need to be able to work with to achieve stable policies. So a lot of my evolution began with the idea of taking environment more seriously than a lot of environmentalists did. From there, it's another step to realize that what they're missing is the fact that the world is now dominated by the human species. So if you look at, for example, climate change, it's one thing to look at it and say, well, what we need to do is cut back. But it's another thing to look at it and say, what it represents is a perturbation of the carbon cycle. And that perturbation is not going to go away because if you try to fix 
the carbon cycle by, for example, using biofuels, you're liable to break the nitrogen cycle and the phosphorus cycle. And there's going to be economic impacts and people are going to fight back culturally because they have different values. And so you immediately become involved in all of these systems that operate at regional and global scales. And that complexity is unavoidable. Both the Kyoto Protocol and that negotiating process and geoengineering proposals tend to look at climate change as a problem to be solved rather than a condition that we need to learn to mitigate, to adapt to, to manage as part of the human condition in the Anthropocene. The difference is very profound because if something is a problem, then I can solve it. I may be able to solve it through a technology, I may be able to solve it through a particular policy, but I can solve it. If something is a condition, if it is part of the human condition, then I can't simply address it with simple fixes. Instead, I have to appreciate and embrace the complexity. So you, you work with and adapt to the system in real time as it evolves, rather than trying to come up with ways that are going to fix problems. Because what we have in this world are not problems. What we have are conditions, and they're very complex, and they're very hard to address through simplistic solutions. Once you, once you get into human systems, though, you get into an entirely new level of complexity. And the reason is that human systems are wicked systems. That is that because humans interact with the systems they're part of, uh, those systems become very unpredictable, very uncertain, and very contingent. If the rate of change is relatively slow, that's not a problem because humans are temporal beings, we will simply live through that period with assumptions that may be contingent, but they're not changing fast enough to bother us. What, what's happening now, though, is that the technologies are changing fast enough, and they're affecting the human more than they have. And because of that, the rate of change is driving our assumptions to change much more rapidly. And that means we're much more uncomfortable. If you look around the world, you see an upsurge of fundamentalism. You see it in religions, you see it in politics, you see it in environmentalism. Uh, and I think there's at least one core cause that cuts across all of these, and that is that the rate of change has accelerated to the point where many people are feeling a loss of control and fear for the future. You can see, of course, the problem that this raises. Because what it means is, just at the time when we need to be able to embrace complexity and deal with it, we're falling back onto simplistic ideologies because they give us a sense of psychological relief and protection. So it's a very difficult trend. How it will play out, I think we'll just have to wait and see. What we can say is that we need to be able to be much more flexible in our ethics without losing the need to be highly ethical in our behavior. Uh, this is doable, but it's not a way of thinking that most people tend to have, tend to have uh, explored deeply. Similarly, we can look at some of the policy implications that, that come up. Uh, some people, let's go back to climate change, since we've talked a lot about that and most people are familiar with it. The Kyoto process was basically an effort to take a highly ethical approach to climate change by setting up a simple rule, stop emitting carbon dioxide. Uh, it's much more complicated than that in details, but that's the underlying core of the Kyoto Protocol process. The problem with that is we're not going to stop. India is not going to stop. China is not going to stop. The U.S. is not going to stop. Indonesia is not going to stop. So we are going to be emitting CO2. And in fact, in the 20 years we've tried to work with the Kyoto Protocol, carbon dioxide emissions have gone up every year. And part of the reason is not just a uh, a policy failure, but an ethical failure. And the ethical failure is that we deliberately oversimplified the system and tried to respond to it in that way. 
And in doing so, we assured the failure of our policy. So I would argue that the ethics of climate change are in fact far more complex than most people involved in climate change actually realize or are willing to admit because it requires that we develop something that works in the real world and that is able to contemplate the complexity of the systems involved. The applied rationality of the Enlightenment is a very powerful methodology, particularly when it was developed into the scientific method. Uh, it became a very powerful way of understanding and man manipulating reality. Uh, you built jet airplanes, you built very complex infrastructures, you built all kinds of things, which is not to say that technology is just something that the West has done, but it is to say that the scientific method gives you extraordinary power in that area. But the second thing, that the Enlightenment did, which was very important, was it allowed for uh, the development of uh, ideologies, of uh, patterns of thought, of worldviews that uh, challenged the Enlightenment from its own precepts. So if you look at the, the most powerful challenges to the Enlightenment up until perhaps the collapse of the, uh, the Cold War uh, confrontation between, between the East and the West, uh, the most powerful challenges all came from the Enlightenment. Uh, Freudian psychology was an extraordinary challenge to the way we thought about ourselves. We thought of ourselves as rational creatures, and to have Freud throw up the irrationality of, of the human was, was uh, extraordinarily challenging. Darwin remains a challenge to many, many people. Uh, classic Enlightenment thought. Uh, Marx the strongest challenge to capitalism did not come from the societies that were being overrun by European and American imperialism. It came from Marx, who was very much an Enlightenment product. So that the Enlightenment was able to throw up challenges to itself, which enabled it to grow. It's, it's, uh, in some ways, it oversimplifies it, but, but it's, in some ways, it's, it's the... the um, Hegelian process, right? You, you have a synthesis, and then from the synthesis, you develop an antithesis, uh, a new thesis, and then the antithesis develops and you get a new synthesis. So you, you get that dialectic behavior. Uh, that's very much an enlightenment process. And because in general, those cultures that embrace the enlightenment never developed very strong and powerful uh, social and cultural controls, you had the ability to have that continuing ferment. Uh, it's not, again, not to say that it's only in the West, but it is a very powerful component of the Western experience. The Enlightenment has led to some very powerful disciplines to think about human cognition, psychology, uh, at the level of the community, sociology, uh, other approaches, uh, uh, studying the brain, um, the neurobiology of the brain. But now we're getting into a situation where cognition is arising out of integrated human technology systems rather than simply arising from the human brain. That's a very, very complex phenomenon. And we don't know how to think about it. And indeed, even from a theoretical perspective, whether an individual human being can understand cognition that necessarily requires the complexity of an integrated human technology network to evolve is an open question. What is the psychology of augmented cognition when it involves human and technological components? That's not a question we're prepared to answer. And arguably, it's not a question that applied rationality allows you to answer. There's another very difficult uh, characteristic of complex adaptive systems. And that is that any worldview that is simple enough to be coherent necessarily only gives you a partial perspective on a complex adaptive system. What that means is that the best I can do with applied rationality and a complex system is understand it partially. 
If you really want to understand a complex system, that means you've got to find ways of looking at different, perhaps mutually exclusive perspectives and integrating them. That's something that some systems do pretty well. For example, pluralistic democracies tend to do that. But it's not something that the uh, applied rationality of the Enlightenment lends itself to. Dan and I actually had a hard, uh, uh, a hard problem with that because we're both very fond of Enlightenment values. Uh, we're both ourselves creatures of the Enlightenment. And things like human freedom, human dignity are very, very appealing to us. Uh, but the question is, how do you protect those values in a world that is dramatically changing when the tools of the Enlightenment may not be adequate? One of the things that I, I ask my students in, in my class is, what is, the, what is the primary characteristic you would expect in a species that grows to dominate a planet? And it's, of course, conflict, aggression. The reason that humans have grown to dominate their planet is that they are aggressive against each other. They are aggressive against the environment. They continually strive to improve their control over systems, uh, and thus they generate conflict. And if you look at culture, culture tends to evolve where there's conflict. Culture does not evolve in uh, rural areas. It does not evolve in pastoral communities. Culture tends to evolve in cities where people bang up against one another, where different people come in from, from different worldviews with different worldviews from different cultures and talk to each other and push each other and challenge each other. Uh, the, the cities that have, that have been the most culturally productive uh, in human history, look at, look at Athens during the period of, of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. It was, it was in virtual civil war. Uh, look at Florence of the Enlightenment. Uh, it was hardly a peaceful city. Look at Elizabethan London. Uh, you know, gentlemen had to carry their swords, not because they were interested in looking uh, cute, but because they had to use them uh, to protect themselves. Uh, look at Confucius to pick another culture. Confucius arose not during a period when one of the great Chinese dynasties had established peace across most of China. Confucius arose during the uh, spring and autumn period, which was a period of conflict. Uh, and there are, are arguments by many people that conflict is a source of human creativity, a source of cultural creativity. But there's the challenge, right? The challenge is that conflict is also extraordinarily destructive. So how do you generate conflict that is productive, that is useful? Uh, we haven't looked at that a lot because a lot of people who oppose destructive conflict tend to oppose conflict in general. Uh, people, want, people want peace. This is, this is entirely desirable, and indeed, uh, I think everyone wishes that we lived in a peaceful world. But if conflict, in fact, is a source of human creativity, then we need to understand how to manage conflict so that it is productive. The, um, the, the challenge, I think, particularly for, for us moderns, is to, is to learn how to, how to um, respect our ignorance, uh, to be uh, humble in the light of systems that are beyond our understanding, but that we have to grapple with and try to manage as best we can. A lot, of the, a lot of the challenges that we create for ourselves come from the fact that we think we know more than we do, and we think we know enough to tell other people what they should do without listening to them. And I think that if we're humble and respect our ignorance, we take a large step towards being able to 
encourage the evolution of ideas, solutions that we may never have been able to think of on our own. Uh, a very trivial example, uh, when, when my students in my class ask me to give them opinions about various things, I almost never do because my opinions, I have my opinions, I have strong ones in some cases, but they're my opinions. And my opinions are only the opinion of one person in a world that is full of different ideas, different ways of thinking, and that is changing much more rapidly than I can comprehend. There's a lot going on, and we have to be humble if we're going to be able to see it and to appreciate it. But we also can't think that what's going on is going to, in fact, manage the problem because we don't know that either. The world is open-ended. It's an evolving system, and a truly evolving system does not have a teleology, an end goal in mind. We talk about sustainability as being a desirable end goal, but that's not where this system is going. The system doesn't care what we think. The system goes, and it changes. And if you're going to truly understand that, you have to start by being very humble in the face of all that complexity, and to be honest, all that beauty. But, you know, the, the, beauty of, the beauty of the historical moment is that our children are going to see things that no generation of humans has ever seen or probably has ever imagined. The things that they see, the world that they face is going to be dangerous beyond our ability to predict it, but it's also going to be beautiful, not in the sense of, of daisies and bunnies, but in the sense of a, a truly awesome world. And, and I, think that's, I think that's an enormous gift. It may, it may be very unpleasant, but it's an enormous gift. It's going to be a very, very challenging but, but beautiful world, not in the trivial sense of beautiful, but in, in the sense of, of truly something that, that we can't imagine. 